My name is uh, Raymond Kim. I'm a medical geneticist at uh, Princess Margaret. I started in October 2014. Um, I did my MD-PhD here. The last time I s stood at this podium was defending my PhD with TACMAC, and now I'm here giving a talk as a faculty member. Um, I did my residency in internal medicine, and then I did a fellowship in medical genetics at the Hospital for Sick Children. So I'm going to talk about hereditary cancer, the next generation. It's a pun on uh, next generation sequencing and not Star Trek, but we are moving into the future. So first, uh, a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic terminology and some fundamental genetic concepts in medical genetics. When to consider a hereditary cancer? What is involved in a genetics assessment? What is involved in the surveillance of individuals who do have a hereditary etiology of their cancer? and really how we can learn from these families on cancer in general, uh, because many of the lessons learned from cancer biology in sporadic or, or common cancers is, is learned from uh, studying these families. So I'll try to go across the site groups. Unfortunately, I deal with a molecule that spans more than one site group, and that's the DNA molecule. So we'll try to move on through, through these, but you'll see that there's significant amount of overlap. And I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic testing, which remains to be a black box to a lot of the audience, but I'm trying to make it more mainstream, and a little bit about genetic counseling. So first, I hearken back to Alfred Knudsen, who everybody knows and everybody studies in their exams that, that developed the two-hit hypothesis. But the two-hit hypothesis was actually um, discovered by studying hereditary retinoblastoma. So Knudsen looked at individuals who had a hereditary form or a familial form of retinoblastoma, he, he found that they had a first hit that they were born with compared to sporadic or non-hereditary forms of retinoblastoma where individuals are born normal and then they acquire the first hit during life and the second hit later on in life. And as you can see from the graph here, the individuals who are born with a retinoblastoma mutation develop RB much more earlier than their um, non-hereditary counterparts. So I really want to distinguish what sporadic cancer and hereditary cancer is because a lot of patients come to me and, and wonder why they're actually seeing me. So in sporadic cancer, which is the majority of cancers, this is 90% of the patients seen here at the P Princess Margaret, the genetic change occurs during life. They're actually born with a normal set of cancer genes, and then something happens during life, whether it be smoking, obesity, alcohol, etc., or a virus, and that that change or, 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 or agent results in a mutation detected in the tumor only. So for instance, if you smoked, you get a mutation in your lung cell and then you get lung cancer. You see both hits in the tumor because you follow Nunsen's two-hit hypothesis, but you actually see no, none in the blood because you weren't born with a genetic change. There's really no family in the family tree, and usually this occurs in elderly individuals. In hereditary cancer, it's quite different. It occurs in the minority of patients. About 10% of all cancer patients, we believe, have a hereditary form of their cancer. They're actually born with a genetic mutation. All of their cells in their body carry uh, a mutation, and that's known as a germline mutation. And therefore, it's detectable in their blood cells because it's in all of their cells. And then when you look at the tumor, you see the second hit. And because they have an inherited form, there's a family pattern and they usually get unusual tumors, and they usually get multiple cancers in the same person. And about the, the average age of onset is usually 10 years earlier than the average age of onset compared to sporadic cancer patients. So this is what we use in the genetics clinic describing what sporadic cancer is. Again, you're born with a set of normal genes. Something happens during life, whether it be age, smoking, radiation, or unknown factors, that, that uh, induces the first hit and then the second hit later on in life. The key point here is the rest of the body doesn't have a mutation and generally see a radiation oncologist, surgical oncologist, and medical oncologist. They don't need to see a medical geneticist. Here we see have an individual who, has, who was born with a, a, a genetic mutation and then very quickly in life develops a second hit. So they should see a geneticist and an oncologist. But exactly who do medical geneticists see? It seems to be uh, very confusing for some people because I believe that all diseases have a genetic component, but not all diseases require a genetics consultation. So this is a very simple graph, discerning between environmental effect of disease and genetic load. So here we have primarily environmental disorders, where the genetic contribution is a little bit on the low side, but the environmental effect is quite, 
quite significant. And those are things such as coronary artery disease and hypertension, where we see it runs in families, but there's not really one gene associated with it. Then there's a few genes that interact with the environment, and these are called polygenic disorders, where we believe that there are a few different loci, such as in diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease, where the HLA locuses play a significant role. But again, there's not one single gene, and there's interaction with the environment. We, the, the geneticists normally sit up here in their little silos, looking at patients who have very extremely rare disorders where one gene causes one disorder. And the common ones are Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, where if you have a mutation in one gene, you have the disorder. Now, where hereditary cancer fits in is probably in this area here, where it's not fully penetrant, meaning that if you have the mutation, you're not 100% guaranteed of getting cancer, but it puts you at a much higher risk than the rest of the population. So what incomplete penetrance is, it's defined as the proportion of mutation carriers who harbor any manifestation of a disease. So hereditary cancer means high penetrance, but not complete penetrance, such as sickle cell, Huntington's, and cystic fibrosis. So mutation carriers at a high risk of developing mutation, no malignancy, but however, some mutation carriers do not develop malignancy. So this is a, a cohort of seven BRCA carriers. Two of them develop ovarian cancer, one develops breast cancer, but the blue guys, they don't have any cancer. So it is decreased penetrance, about 40% if you just use this example here. So we're going to move on and discuss a little bit about hereditary cancer syndromes. When the last catalog in 2008, there were 50 of them. Now there are over 300 of them in the online Mendelian inheritance in man. They're often under-recognized and under-referred. And germline genetic testing does affect surveillance, the surgical management, and the eligibility for, for trial. So these eligibility for trials are distinct from somatic profiling um, uh, programs such as IMPACT where those are looking at non-inherited changes in the tumor. So in your package is this recent guideline from the American College of Medical Genetics. It has very, very nice tables where you're ever concerned if a patient has potentially has a hereditary etiology. You can turn to these tables and see what type of pathology they have, look at their family history and whether or not they have a genetic warrant a genetics assessment on what genes we're actually looking at. And gene reviews usually has the very quickest up-to-date um, information about all 300 of these hereditary cancer syndromes. So we'll move on to talking about them. The most common and the most uh, famous one is BRCA1. So this is what Angelina Jolie has. So BRCA1 is caused by a germline mutation in the BRCA1 gene, and it puts you at a significantly high risk of developing breast cancer, up to 70% in some populations, a high risk of ovarian cancer, and also prostate cancer. The management here involves surveillance, and we actually don't uh, do CA125 and ultrasound anymore for the um, ov ovarian cancer risk, but we do do high-risk breast MRI and mammography. In the management, if an individual does have a BRCA mutation, they, uh, they may opt for a bilateral mastectomy, and we recommend, at, due to their ovarian cancer risk, that after they have uh, uh, children, that they have a prophylactic salpingo-oophorectomy. They also are eligible for, for PARP trials, which these individuals are exquisitely sensitive to. Its sister is BRCA2. So BRCA2 also has an increased risk of breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer, but they also have an increased risk of male breast cancer, melanoma, and pancreatic cancer. So what's interesting about this gene is that it's, it's involved in the Fanconi anemia pathway, and if you have one mutation, so if a mom has a, has a mutation in BRCA1, they actually are at risk of having breast and ovarian cancer. But if they have a child that has two mutations, say, for instance, dad is also a carrier, th that leads to a severe uh, bone marrow disorder known as Fanconi anemia. So they have short stature, abnormal thumbs, and cafe au macules. So when to suspect BRCA1 and BRCA2? One is that they're from a BRCA1 and BRCA2 family. You'd be surprised that a lot of individuals, they're so caught up with their cancer uh, history that they don't um, uh, disclose that they actually have a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation in their family. Ethnicity, there are a few founder mutations among the Ashkenazi du Jewish individuals. And the very, very easy ones that are eligible for BRCA1 and BRCA2 are individuals who have bilateral breast cancer if they're under 35, if all males with breast cancer should have a BRCA1 and BRCA2 test, all invasive serous ovarian cancer due to the prevalence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 in these, in these cohorts should have uh, BRCA1 and 2 testing. The rare medullary breast cancer, around 11% uh, are BRCA1 uh, carriers. 
And according to NCCN, all triple negative breast cancers under the age of 60 should have um, BRCA testing. And then there's the strong family history of, of breast and ovarian cancer. And depending where we live, if we live in the US, they use NCCN. If we live in Ontario, we have to follow the Ministry of Health guidelines. And there, it really depends on how strong your family history is. And that's where the genetics assessment does come in handy. But basically, this is the Ministry of Health guidelines on who the ministry will pay for BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing. At least two cases of cancer on the same side of the family. Basically, you get more points for ovarian cancer and you get more points for male breast cancer and you get more points for young breast cancer. And young breast cancer is defined as under 60 or under 50. And then at least three cases of cancer on the same side of the family of breast and ovarian cancer would make you eligible for BRCA1 and 2 testing. The NCCN is much more liberal in their type of assessment in terms of who is eligible for BRCA1 and 2 assessment. Any individual who has breast cancer under the age of 45, they say ha should have BRCA1 and 2 testing. Again, the TN under 60. Also, they incorporate pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. So if there's a strong family history of high Gleason prostate cancer or if there's a family history of pancreatic cancer, they also incorporate that into their calculations. So who to test? Fortunately, oncologists usually see patients with cancer. So patients affected with cancer are the most appropriate individuals to test to interpret the genetic results. So usually you want the patient in front of you to have cancer, so if you analyze BRCA1 and 2, you can correlate any difference you see in the genes with their phenotype. If you have an individual who has a strong family history of cancer, but yet she or he herself do not have cancer, it's very difficult to interpret the test. So ideally, we want the individual who has cancer. So here we have an individual coming in here. She's a young lady, we'll call her Angelina. Angelina comes into the clinic and says, um, Dr. Kim, I'm very worried about my family history of uh, breast cancer. My mom had breast cancer, my aunt had ovarian cancer, and my cousin had breast cancer at the age of 38. So would you offer genetic testing to Angelina despite her high Hollywood profile? <laughs> the, the answer here is no, because the most informative individuals lie here, here, and here. We have, an, we have three individuals who have breast cancer and ovarian cancer that would be much more informative than testing her because she may not have inherited the mutation from her mother. However, in cancer, a lot of the times, the patient's family members who did have cancer are dead. So what are we supposed to do in this type of scenario? So in this type of scenario, we still wouldn't offer it to her. Because if we think what is going on in these four individuals is due to a BRCA1 and 2 mutation, this is the key individual. This key individual here had a daughter who had breast cancer, therefore, and a mother who had ovarian cancer. So he is known as an obligate carrier. And he may have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation that doesn't manifest as disease because he does not have a breast or ovary. So he's the obligate carrier if we think that there is something going on in this family, and we would test him. However, in Hollywood, there's lots of strife between families, and we know that Angelina, Angelina and her dad do not get along, so there's no contact with this uncle, let's say. So there we use a, very, a variety of different risk calculations to determine if she, in fact, has a risk of above 10%, and we put them in calculators known as BRCA Pro, etc., and if her risk is above 10%, then we proceed with genetic testing with the caveat that it has a lot of limitations. So I'm going to talk about my next uh, syndrome known as leaf raumani syndrome. So I think a lot of the audience know that P53 is a very strong uh, tumor suppressor gene. It's seen in a lot of different cancers. However, if you do inherit a mutation in the P53 gene, you develop a syndrome known as leaf raumani syndrome. And they have a, uh, have a family history of, of a pattern of the core leaf raumani cancers. That includes brain, choroid plexus carcinoma in children, breast cancer, early sarcoma, adrenocortical carcinoma, bronchovalvular cancer, and GI malignancies. So when are you going to suspect an inherited P53 mutation? So NCCN says all individuals who have breast cancer under the age of 35 should have TP53 testing. If there's a strong family history of core cancers, all adrenal cortical carcinomas should have P53 testing, and all sarcomas under 45 years of age is beginning to be an emerging population that all should have uh, P53 testing. So this is one of my patients. Um, she was profiled in the Toronto Star with commentary by myself and Ava Gupta. 
She is a typical Lee Frau Maney um, patient of mine. She's 34 years old. At three years of age, developed an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma of the uh, cervical spine. At 18 years of age, had papillary thyroid cancer. Then at 23 years of age, Bob Bell uh, uh, performed surgery on her uh, left thigh sarcoma. And at 27 years of age, she had an abdominal sarcoma. And at 31 years of age, she has a recurrence of her next, uh, her next sarcoma. So she's only 34 years old and has almost five cancers. And last I checked, she has a sixth cancer. So she has a mutation in the P53 gene. This is what the mutation looks like. It's a missense mutation, causes inactivation of the DNA binding domain, making these individuals exquisitely sensitive to developing cancer. So because they are at high risk of cancer, women at 100% of developing cancer during their lifetime, men at 75%, the main difference is because of the breast uh, difference. They do have options such as risk-reducing mastectomy, and there's a Toronto protocol that David Malkin developed at Sick Kids, which we follow, which includes a breast MRI beginning at 25, or 20 to 25, depending on the family, a rapid whole body MRI from the neck down to the toes for sarcoma, an annual brain MRI, ultrasound every six months, a derm exam, and early colonoscopy. Now, we think that uh, oxidative phosphorylation and metformin and glucose metabolism plays a role in these, these uh, families. So there is an NIH trial, which some of my patients are on, uh, to uh, have two grams of metformin every day. And when I came here, the Toronto Protocol was actually well established at, at sick kids, but the adolescents and young adults were usually lost to follow up. They're usually told, go see your family doctor to organize this business here. And the family doctor says, I don't even know how to organize a whole body MRI. Fortunately, the, the radiology department here has been quite uh, generous in that, that I am able to order a whole body MRI, and they conduct it the same day as their brain MRI. And I see these patients um, on my Monday afternoon clinics at the, the Familial Breast and Ovarian Cancer Clinic. So the next syndrome that I, I, I see often in that clinic is called Cowden syndrome. So Cowden syndrome is due to a mutation in P10, which is another somatic gene, but if you have an inherited form, you have this hereditary cancer syndrome. They have a 85% breast cancer risk. They have significant thyroid disease, either it be a multinodular goiter or a follicular uh, a thyroid cancer. They're at increased risk of endometrial cancer and colorectal cancer. These patients actually have physical manifestations which, which you may pick up in the clinic, and that includes developmental delay. They have some autism. They have a large head circumference, uh, about 60 centimeters. They have papillomas on the skin and the mucosa in their mouth, so they usually have dental uh, problems. And they have dysplastic gangliocytoma of the cerebellum, so it's this Lermite Duclos uh, syndrome, which is pathognomonic, pathognomonic for uh, Cowden syndrome. And they also have unusual skin lesions on their hands and their feet known as achokeratoses. So how do we manage these patients? Similar to the leaf Romanis, but their cancer risk isn't as high as 100% as in the women. So we arrange a thyroid ultrasound. We start high-risk breast screening when they're 30. The colonoscopy starts a little bit later. The ultrasounds also start a little bit later. And we send them to Sarah Ferguson for an endometrial biopsy. Um, so again, these patients I've taken on and are in my Monday clinic at the Familial Breast and Ovarian Cancer Clinic. So if you have any of them, I'm happy to see them. We'll move on to the GI system. The GI system, it, um, the most common disorder is known as Lynch syndrome. And the reason I bring back Lynch syndrome, it's actually moving very, very quickly. This field is moving very quickly in terms of the analysis of the tumor and, the t and in terms of the analysis of the blood. It is caused by four, four genes which are involved in the mismatch repair pathway. <clears throat> if you have a mutation in any of one of these genes, you're at increased risk of colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian, hepatobiliary, adrenocortical carcinoma also. So when are you going to consider Lynch syndrome? So there's something that's called Amsterdam criteria, where if you have three individuals in a family two are first-degree relatives, and one had a Lynch syndrome cancer under the age of 50, you should suspect Lynch syndrome. According to Ontario, all colorectal cancers under the age of 35 should have a Lynch syndrome assessment. If you have colorectal cancer and another Lynch syndrome cancer, such as a urothelial uh, um, cancer, you should be assessed for Lynch syndrome. And there's other ongoing screening protocol. For example, in NCCN, they, are screening, they recommend screening all individuals who have colorectal cancer under the age of 60, no, under 70, um, 
And at UHN with Sarah Ferguson, all endometrial cancers under 70 are having Lynch syndrome assessments. The mainstay of, of management there is annual colonoscopy and, and considering endometrial surveillance. So what do I mean by a Lynch syndrome assessment? So this is what a Lynch syndrome assessment is on the tumor. It's, it's immunohistochemistry on the Lynch syndrome tumor. We look at whether or not the, the protein is present, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. So if the protein is present, it will stain brown. If it is absent or abnormal, it will not stain. So by taking the tumor of these colorectal cancer patients, all under 70, or endometrial cancer, all under, under 70 also, we will be able to pick up these cases by doing routine uh, reflex immunohistochemistry. And based on this result, if it is normal, they are just sent off to their oncologist. If this is abnormal, they are sent to a genetics clinic. Now, interestingly, uh, there is a sixth gene associated with uh, Lynch syndrome, and that's called EPCAM. It's involved in the matrix processing of uh, connective tissue, but actually it in itself does not cause Lynch syndrome. Mutations don't cause it. It's actually a deletion of this EPCAM gene, which causes epigenetic regulation of the downstream gene, which is a Lynch syndrome gene, M MSH2. It's just a very interesting mechanism on how EPCAM mutations induce Lynch syndrome through MSH2. Another interesting feature of these tumors is that they are microsatellite unstable. So microsatellites are regions in your genome that are repeated, not for really any functional reason, but because these, these tumors have mismatch instability, these uh, microsatellites start to expand and contract because they're very vulnerable to the mismatch repair uh, pathway. So under normal circumstances, you'll have a set number of uh, polymorphisms related to your microsatellites, but then you start seeing this laddering or this microsatellite instability in the tumor. And this again can be done with tumor analysis. So we haven't seen the patient yet. Now, now why I think, think uh, Lynch syndrome is leading the field is because Vogelstein's group at, uh, at, at Hopkins has shown that misratch repair deficiency tumors are exquisitely sensitive to PD-1 or immunotherapy blockade. And what he's shown in his New England paper here is that those individuals who are mismatch proficient or don't have a mismatch problem have a progression of disease on anti-PD-1. Those individuals who have mismatch deficient colorectal cancer, the ones in blue, actually see a regression of their disease. And you can see that there's a lot more mutations in these tumors than in these tumors. So the rationale is that mismatch repair induces a lot of mutations. These, these mutations induce more neoepitopes making them more susceptible to a PD-1 blockade. Next, I'm going to move on to kidney. This is one of my favorite organs. Um, now, there's a nice little table there at the end. Um, it's a blue sheet. And uh, it, it should hearken to those individuals who take care of kidney cancer patients um, when to think about hereditary kidney cancer. So again, if you have a young individual who has kidney cancer, and young we're defining as about 45 to 50 years of age who has kidney cancer, then you should think about a hereditary disorder. So rare histologies such as PAP type 1 are suggestive of hereditary papillary RCC, and they are due to uh, mutations in the MET gene. Papillary type 2 is associated with a mutation in FH which causes hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cells. So if you see a young patient who has papillary type 2, also has fibroids when they're quite young, around their 30s, you should think about this syndrome. And again, in these families, they're at risk of having a children who have fumarate hydratase because if the husband is also a carrier or the wife is also a carrier, they result in a severe metabolic disorder. Bert hogg dubé the pathology associated with Bert hogg dubé is associated with... Um, uh, chromophobic, oncocytic, and uh, oncocytic hybrid tumors. And these patients have fiber folliculomas on their face, these small little bumps on their face, and have a mutation in the folliculin gene. So this is a clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the more um, common uh, cancer. And as the audience could see, I'm a little bit under the weather. So I thought I would let William Defoe Imagine you talk about cancer. VHL. Again and again and again. That's what it's like to have VHL. VHL, 
or von Hippel-Lindau is a terrible disease that affects one in 36,000 people, men, women, and children all over the world. Throughout their lives, these people will develop tumors in their eyes, their brain, spine, kidney, pancreas. They will undergo surgery to remove these tumors, and the tumors will come back, this time in the kidney or eye, maybe next time in the brain. This is a genetic condition. A person born with VHL is born with one malfunctioning gene, a mutation that causes clusters of blood vessels and then finally tumors. Studying this specific disease could help understand all types of cancers, but this research isn't cheap or easy. There are children as young as two living with this awful condition. There are mothers, fathers, artists, athletes, servicemen and women and educators who are fighting through it year by year, tumor by tumor. Let us end this endless cycle. Help us to find a cure so we can stop VHL and other life-threatening cancers. So I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, What's the relationship? I don't know what the relationship is quite. I, I dug a little bit of digging. I did a little bit of digging. I don't know exact, the exact relationship between him, but he's like an ambassador for the VHL Alliance. <laughs> so as, as William had mentioned, that uh, mutations in VHL cause uh, hypoxia, which causes these blood vessels, and they get tumors from the brain down to the, to the testes. Interestingly, the genetic concept I wanted to uh, highlight here is something called variable expressivity, meaning that simply because you have a VHL mutation does not mean you're going to have all of the manifestations. Some people have a retinal hemangioblastoma, some people have kidney cancer, some people have a FEO. Interestingly, a frame shift results in an increased risk of developing a renal cell carcinoma, and a missense mutation results in a risk of having a FEO instead. Now, as part of this, uh, we joined the VHL Alliance, which William was talking about, in that we found that the, the patients here at, at Princess Margaret who had potentially VHL were not really taken care of. So we applied to the Von Hippel Lindau Alliance to become a clinical care of excellence. And since July 2015, we have a network of individuals who are very interested in taking care of these patients, such as endocrine, neurosurge, optho, neurology, urology, genetics, oncology, gynae, and ENT. And uh, a GU nurse by the name of Laura Legere uh, gets a lot of referrals through this website asking how to be taken care of. And in terms of the surveillance, it's quite involved also, like Lee Fraumani is, in that you need an abdominal image every year, either CT, MRI is better, or um, um, ultrasound. They also need imaging of their brain and spine. They need an annual endocrine biochemical surveillance, and they need a dilated fundoscopy every year, and they also need annual audiology. These individuals are eligible for TKI therapy. I believe Eric Jonas has a trial going on at MD, um, and I've yet to see the results of that. Now, this is a very, very classic uh, endocrine um, uh, hereditary disorder, but I wanted to bring it to you here because, again, this is really advanced the um, understanding of other, other types of cancers. In medullary thyroid cancers, all of them should have a RET analysis because about a quarter of, of them are hereditary and 75% are sporadic. And they are often multifocal or bilateral and have young people. But I actually diagnosed a 60-year-old with a RET mutation in my clinic the other day. So just to be sure, whenever I see a medullary thyroid cancer, regardless of age, regardless of Focality, I will send off for RET testing. So MEN type 2A is characterized by medullary thyroid cancer, thyroid hyperplasia. They are also at increased risk of developing a FEO. Type 2B, due to another type of mutation within the same gene, are at increased risk of, again, MTC. But they also have physical features. They're also very tall, have long arms, um, and look marfanoid. And they are also at risk of pheochromocytoma. And there's a very strong genotype-phenotype correlation where there's some individuals who have a RET mutation and only have familial medullary thyroid cancer, and it's called familial medullary thyroid cancer. Now, depending on where the mutation is on this receptor tyrosine kinase, the American Thyroid Association <coughs> puts them at a different risk category in terms of when recommending surgical management. So this is 
exquisite genotype phenotype uh, correlations. Now I'm going to move on to another uh, pheochromocytoma syndrome, and this is called isolated paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma. And this is a, a big chunk of patients I see in my uh, personal clinic. And these are due to mutations in the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle involves a molecule known as succinate dehydrogenase or a protein known as succinate dehydrogenase. You can see VHL is floating around here too, and HIF1-alpha is involved in this whole pathway. And mutations in this subunit put patients at increased risk of developing a pheochromocytoma. Now, what is this succinate dehydrogenase? It's, it's composed of a variety of subunits, <coughs> subunit A, B, C, and D. It has an assembly factor known as AF2. And they cause tumors in the autonomic nervous system, where you either get a pheochromocytoma, where it's, if it's in the adrenal gland, or you get paragangliomas if it's outside of the adrenal gland. So how do we detect these patients? Similarly, as with um, Lynch syndrome, SDHB immunohistochemistry is routinely conducted at UHN to see if they actually have a deficiency in this complex. And importantly, these patients also have an increased risk of clear cell RCC, which is not surprising given von Hippel-Lindau and this whole oxidative Krebs cycle pathway. So succinate dehydrogenase immunohistochemistry is done. If it is normal and you see staining, I think it's the blue, uh, you are at risk of having a syndromic cause, meaning von Hippel-Lindau neurofibromatosis or MEN2, or you may have a non-syndromic cause, cause not caused by one of the SDH subunits. However, this is not sensitive or specific enough, so actually up to 40% of all paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas, regardless of staining, are due to an inherited etiology, so even if the staining is intact, even if there's no family history, it's a very, very high pickup rate for us in the clinic. So we send them for a gene panel associated with 11 different genes associated with hereditary uh, paraganglioma, and it's a big, big pickup rate. Now I'm going to move into the CNS. Um, I'm going to talk about nerve sheath tumors. This is the pathology of neurofibromas. The big difference between these nerve sheath tumors and schwannomas is that they contain some soft tissue also. And in schwannomas, it's primarily Schwann cells. So nerve sheath tumor syndromes are hereditary. Many of them are hereditary. One of my favorite is the neurofibromatosis type 1. It's actually one of the more common disorders. So say, for instance, von Hippel-Lindau, William Defoe said it was 1 in 36,000. In neurofibromatosis, it's actually only 1 in 3,000. So there's NIH diagnostic criteria of this. It's, you usually have to have a first-degree relative with NF1. Lots of cafe au lait macules on the skin. They have axillary or inguinal fleck freckling. They have big plexiform neurofibromas or cutaneous neurofibromas, which are seen here. They have growths in their eyes known as Lish nodules. They have optic gliomas, which usually do not result in any uh, problems and regress through their adolescence. And they also have skeletal anomalies such as phenoid wing dysplasia, which causes them to have facial asymmetry, and thinning of the thin bo uh, long bones, which causes uh, pseudoarthrosis. So this is the Lish nodules, these are cafe au macules, and these are the cutaneous neurofibromas. Now, they do have a lot of CNS and PNS lesions. They have unidentified bright objects in the brain, which usually don't require any clinical intervention. They have large plexiform neurofibromas, but sometimes these UBOs can progress into tumors of the brain, mainly in the optic and the, the, the thalamus area. And there, they need a neurosurgeon. So other complications include pheochromocytoma. They're at risk of having a pheochromocytoma. They're at risk of having osteoporosis. They're at increased risk of having breast cancer. They're at increased risk of having GIS. They're at increased risk of developing malignant peripheral neural sheath tumors. And there, the harbinger is that if your plexiform is growing very quickly, or if you're complaining of more pain, then we re-image the, the site of interest, and then we go in with a biopsy. And these patients are high-need patients because they have developmental delay, seizures, and other mood disorders. So we consider NF1 genetic testing on all MPNST patients. It's usually a clinical diagnosis, but a lot of these patients are mosaic, meaning that they don't have a mutation in their whole body, only <coughs> in a certain area. And recently, we started a multidisciplinary neurofibromatosis clinic at the Toronto General Hospital with Galerie Zadeh, Catherine Maurice, Vera Brill. So we see them on Wednesday afternoons. All of us get together. They see genetics, they see neurology, they see neurosurgery, and then they're out the door. 
Similarly, for neurofibromatosis type 2, the hallmark of this is bilateral acoustic neuromas. They actually don't have neurofibromatosis. It's a misnomer. They don't have cafe au lait macules. They don't have axillary frecklings. Their acoustic neuromas are not neurofibromas. They're actually schwannomas and don't have any connective tissue. They're at increased risk of developing meningiomas, schwannomas, gliomas, and have a lot of eye problems also. If a patient does not have schwannomas in the brain, but have schwannomas in the rest of their body, depending on the number of them, they may have a disorder known as schwannomatosis. Schwannomatosis is caused by a gene known as SMARC-B1. It is involved in chromatin remodeling. And these patients, although they have schwannomatosis, the very, very uh, sensitive clinical sign is that they really, really complain of a lot of pain due to these schwannomas. And there's a lot of decreased penetrance, meaning that there's a lot of mutation carriers who actually have no schwannomas whatsoever. The last CNS um, uh, disorder I'd like to talk about is actually a systemic disorder, but I put it in the CNS section because it involves a lot of the brain in that they have cortical tubers, subependymal nodules, and subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. And this is a disease known as tuberous sclerosis caused by mutations in TSC1 and TSC2. So in the brain, there's lots of manifestations. They also have developmental delay. They also have seizures. They're very similar to the NF1 patients, mainly because TSC1 and NF1 are involved in the RAS pathway. So this is what we see in these patients. They have bumps on their face, known as adenoma sebaceum. They have shea green patches. The kidney guys are involved because they have angiomyolipomas. They have ungual fibromas. They're also at increased risk of developing lung cysts in their uh, CT scans, and, and it's called lymphangiomyomatosis, or LAM. There is personalized medicine that has resulted in the understanding of tuberous sclerosis. As I said, TSC1 and TSC2 sits here. It is upstream of the mTOR pathway. And you can see P P10 here and PI3 kinase here and AKT1 is here. NF1 actually plays a role down here too. So individuals who have large subependable giant cell astrocytomas or SEGAs or angiomyolipomas greater than 3 centimeters should be put on Affinitor by uh, Novartis. Some are put on Sirolimus, but they technically should be, should, should be put on Everolimus. And we see, like, like the families actually say, all of my tuberous sclerosis lesions start melting away. So their, their facial angi uh, adenoma sebaceum gets better, their uh, uh, AMLs start regressing, and they feel a lot better, and their seizures get better too. And how long does that last? We don't know. It's... They, they keep going, and we don't have that data yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic testing. So molecular genetic testing, know your alphabet. Understanding the molecular basis of a disease is critical in selecting the appropriate genetic test. Some, it's very straightforward. Other, it's a little bit complicated, like we saw in uh, um, MLH, uh, MSH2 deficiency caused by EPCAM deletion. There are a lot of labs offering different types of technology, and us in medical genetics, we've traditionally had to send them out of country. We apply to the Ministry of Health, they sign a form, and by and large, most of them have been approved. But I'm thankful that many of these tests are now, now being uh, done locally, like P10, VHL, et cetera, with Suzanne's lab, and she has a kidney cancer panel um, um, in the works that I've used. I'm still waiting for those results, but... <laughs> <laughs> A normal, a normal genetic test, though, does not mean you did not have a mutation. Depending on when you were tested, it does not necessarily mean you don't have a mutation because the technology is rapidly moving and the technology is being more sensitive in terms of what mutations are being um, assayed. So depending on when the genetic test was done, the patient could have a mutation. That's either because a new technique or actually BRCA3 or BRCA4 is discovered. So one of the things that I, I propose to the audience is, is that the legacy a family member can leave to their family is their DNA after that they've succumbed to their cancer. Because when BRCA3, BRCA4, BRCA5, you know, VHL2, all of these genes start coming out later on in the family, when the patient comes in and says, when Angelina comes in and says, I'm worried about my family history, but all of my family is dead, I wouldn't have to say to her, there are limitations in, if I do genetic testing on you. I could say to her, we have a DNA uh, a sample banked on your mother because she was a Princess Margaret patient. I can go and check her 
sample for a BRCA3 or a BRCA4 <laughs> mutation that's been discovered in 2020 and see if you're at risk. So I strongly believe that DNA banking should be done on most cancer patients, if not all cancer patients. And, and it's because of these new technologies and all of this experience we're having <coughs> as the technology advances and as we discover new genes. So now we have to select the gene to test. Sometimes it's very straightforward. One disorder, one gene. Like von Hippel-Lindau, we test for VHL. MEN type 2, we test for RET. Lee Fraumani, we test for P53. It becomes slightly more complicated when we have some disorders such as Lynch syndrome, where there's five genes. There, we li rely on the immunohistochemistry. In Cowden syndrome, we test for the more prevalent gene. <coughs> now it's actually becoming extremely complicated, like in pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, where we have 11 genes. In breast cancer, we have all these moderate genes, like, like CHECK2, PALB2, FANC-C. So all of these genes, well, what are we supposed to do with them? So fortunately, the cost of genetic testing has plummeted. My role is no longer to be the gatekeeper of this expensive technology. My role is more to disseminate this technology in the rest of medicine. To give you an idea of what's been going on, at the turn of the century, it took us 20 years to um, sequence an entire genome. It cost $3 billion, and it took 20 years. Now, with next-generation sequencing, it takes about two months, and it costs about $2,000. So it's not that expensive anymore. So cost is not a prohibitive um, a barrier for genetics assessment and genetic testing. So what types of genetic results do we see? The positive results are actually the easiest ones to deal with. A mutation is found. We've seen this mutation before. We've seen it in other families that have BRCA1 and 2. We can make recommendations on you. You need to have prophylactic mastectomy or oophorectomy or high-risk screening and the surveillance decisions and management decisions can be made. A negative test is something that has a lot of caveats. No genetic mutation is found. We always tell our patients that it may be due to a limitation of the technology. It may be that another gene that hasn't been discovered yet wasn't assayed. And we usually tell these patients to revisit our clinic every two years or so to see if there's any new gene discovered or if there's an update on the technique. Now maybe is this variant of uncertain significance. Because we're able to analyze the human genome at such high resolution, we don't know if the genetic changes we see are actually causing disease because there's genetic variation between healthy individuals that we actually don't quite understand yet and we're beginning to learn more and more. And these are called variants of uncertain significance. We don't make management decisions on these variants of uncertain significance. We actually tell the patients, like the negative results, to revisit the clinic to see if more information has been garnered by the genetics community to see if this is a bona fide mutation. And why is this a variant of uncertain significance? It's mainly because we don't see it very commonly in the population. We don't see this genetic variation uh, very frequently. We don't know if it causes disease. We don't know certainly if it causes cancer because we haven't seen it in cancer patients. Now I'm going to talk in the last few minutes about genetic counseling. So I work with genetic counselors very intimately, um, and we work side by side. And genetic testing is a little bit different than other types of testing in that it has implications on family members. So implications on family members, most hereditary cancer syndromes are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning that if you carry a mutation, all of your first degree relatives share your genetic information about 50% and that they are also at 50% risk. There are implications on insurance policies. By and large, this is not applicable to patients who have cancer already because they already have cancer and probably will not qualify for extended life or disability insurance anyways. It mainly plays a role when we see the Angelinas who don't have cancer and whether or not we should do predictive testing on them. And it, it requires appropriate interpretation of the results. There's positive results where we need to make sure they're having all of the recommendations from head to toe. There's negative results where we need to tell them to keep in touch with the clinic. And variants of uncertain significance where we need to really look at this variant very closely. So family member cascade testing, the asymptomatic individuals who don't have cancers, we enroll in surveillance. So I'm going to give you some examples. And prenatal genetics is involved in family planning. So we'll talk about Robert. He's a 43-year-old gentleman who has bilateral clear cell diagnosed at the age of 38. He has a family history of RCC in an uncle. So we do genetic testing for VHL, right? It's pretty, he has, he's young, he has a family history of clear cell. Let's test him for VHL. 
So the VHL uh, testing comebacks, and it, it actually shows a variant of uncertain significance. And this is where the variant of uncertain significance, we really have to look very closely at it. And we discuss with the lab. And actually, when we discuss with the lab, we find something even more remarkable is that even though we haven't seen this mutation before, we've seen this mutation in other families in the same region, but not the same amino acid change. So then we do more phenotypic workup and we see that he has a cerebellar hemangioblastoma, he has pancreatic cysts, so he probably has VHL and that this is actually the real deal. So the patient is diagnosed with VHL and the variant is deemed pathogenic after discussion with the laboratory. And then we, we connect this patient, we connect Robert to the rest of the VHL network with neurosurgery, with endocrine, with medonc, the kidney guys, etc. Then we get a call to the genetic counselor. So Robert's 18-year-old daughter is now pregnant, and he has not shared his information with her yet. It's not uncommon, you know, despite us telling patients that it's not your fault, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's nothing you did, it's nothing you ate that caused this, there is a lot of guilt associated with having a genetic syndrome, especially if they're at risk of sharing that with their kids. Now, because we have his precise mutation, we can do expedited familial testing on the familial mutation on Mary, and that takes about a couple of weeks, as opposed to full genetic sequencing of the VHL gene, which takes maybe a month. So we do expedited genetic testing on her, and we find that she is a carrier for the VHL mutation. So we do biochemical screening and imaging requesting on her. Um, now, what do we do about her baby? So we can actually test her baby to see if the baby carries the VHL change. So we do at 10 weeks, as early as 10 weeks, we can do chorionic fetal sampling, where we take a piece of the placenta, which has the same genetic material as the baby, to give the mother more information on what to do about the uh, pregnancy at that point. So we do this, and of course the baby is found to be a carrier. So prenatal chorionic villus sampling is at 10 weeks is conducted and the, carrier, and the baby is a carrier of the VHL variant. So after a long discussion, Mary decides to stop the pregnancy. Her uncle, who had the clear cell, she knew very dearly, she didn't want a baby that is going to go through VHL. And to, to comment on uh, William Defoe's question is how to cure VHL and how to have a society without VHL, this is a mechanism to stop VHL being passed down to the next generation and we can stop VHL in its tracks by stopping the mutation in subsequent generation. So Mary is enrolled in surveillance. So two years later, when Mary is 20 years old and, it, and the pregnancy was not an unplanned pregnancy, she comes to our clinic and says, uh, I want to have a baby that does not have VHL. I feel very strongly about this. So what can we do for her? So we can take her egg and we can take her partner's sperm put it in a petri dish, do in vitro fertilization, allow the embryos to grow, take one cell out of the blastocyst, test that cell to see if it has the genetic disorder. Now technically, you, there's some technical abnormal, technical details in that you need the parents, but I won't belabor that. Um, but those embryos that do have the genetic change are discarded. And those which do not have the genetic change and, those, and therefore the child is not at risk of having VHL, we implant into the mother, implant into Mary, in guaranteeing that her child does not have the familial mutation. <clears throat> I have some time, so I'm going to talk about another, another scenario. A young breast cancer patient, Charlotte, 29 years old, ERPR negative, HER2 positive with breast cancer. Due to her young age of 29, we are now sending off gene panels, which cover a lot of the genes I talked about. BRCA1, BRCA2, P53, even the moderate penetrant genes. Now she's diagnosed with leaf raumani syndrome. She has a P53 mutation, and she has the Brazilian mutation. So she undergoes high-risk surveillance. She comes in and asks if her two-year-old son, Jeremy, should get tested. Will you test the son? Now, based on our experience with, the, with, with uh, Robert and Clear, so we, we may... So the identification of a mutation in a, in a family that allows that mutation to be tracked in asymptomatic or patients who don't have cancer is called predictive genetic testing, as I alluded to before. Now what this does is it allows us to create a personalized surveillance where the DNA mutation is a crystal ball where we can predict what types of cancer this patient is at risk for and then monitor these patients to prevent cancer early. So do you test Charlotte's son, Jeremy? Probably, right? Yes. 
Jeremy is at 50% risk, a first degree relative of, uh, he is a first degree relative of Charlotte and therefore should have whole body MRI and surveillance for Lee Fraumeni syndrome. So the audience, you're probably asking me, why am I bringing up this, this issue? It seems very straightforward. Now, would your answer be different if she carried a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation? Would you conduct genetic testing on her son, who's two years old at this time? So the American Association of Pediatrics put out a policy statement saying the ethical and policy issues in genetic testing and the screening of children. So BRCA1 is different than P53. Predictive genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2 is deferred into adulthood as there are no childhood manifestations. The, you, we need to respect the autonomy of the child, especially if it's not going to make a, a difference in the management of that child. Unlike in Lee Fraumeni, where there are childhood manifestations, BRCA1 generally does not have childhood manifestations. We usually see the patients when they're around 17 or 18 years of age to make that informed um, choice. So that was my last slide. I just want to take an opportunity to again hammer home a few things. So in your package is a pink sheet, or actually it's, a, it's, a, it's an orange sheet. So, so I didn't have pink, but the orange sheet is for breast cancer practitioners because it was the closest to pink I could get. So those are the guidelines for those individuals who are at increased risk of developing a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So if you ever have a question and you're ever thinking about BRCA1 and 2, just look at that list. And on the back of that list is also uh, the NCCN guidelines. The blue sheet is for the GI people. So the GI people who see a lot of colorectal cancer, those are the Ministry of Health guidelines for those individuals who are eligible for Lynch syndrome testing. So keep that in your uh, pocket if you have it. And then there's a, 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 a big table that I used for the, the kidney clinic. So those individuals who take care of kidney cancer patients, Mike Jewett and I had come up with a uh, rubric to kind of jog your memory in terms of the rare histologies, the syndromes that are associated with kidney cancer. And finally, this paper is actually quite good. So I'm going to go over how to use this paper in two syndromes I did not talk about. So if you have a gastric cancer patient and you have two, two or more cases of gastric cancer, one that's less than uh, 50 degrees, no, 50 years of age, you should consider this HDGC, which is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. And if they have lobular breast cancer, you should consider hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. For the gynae individuals, if you have an unusual tumor known as ovarian sex cord tumors with annular tubules, you should consider this disorder known as Putziegers syndrome. And with that, um, I will stop and I won't answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs>